Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost of the One True God, back with you with the next video in my series reading, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Without further ado, returning to The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, as read by Lord Naren White. I went along, up the bank, with one eye out for pap, and the other one for what the rise might fetch along. Well, all at once, here comes a canoe, just a beauty too, about thirteen or fourteen foot long, riding high like a duck. I shot first, I shot head first off of the bank like a frog, clothes and all on, and struck out for the canoe. I just expected there'd be somebody laying down in it, because people often done that to fool folks, and when a chap had pulled a skiff out most to it, they'd raise up and laugh at him. But it weren't so this time. It was a drift canoe, sure enough, and I clumb, clumb in and paddled her ashore. Thinks I, the old man will be glad when he sees this. She's worth ten dollars. But when I got to shore, Pap wasn't in sight yet, and as I was running it, her into a little creek like a gully, all hung over with vines and willows, I struck another idea. I judged I'd hide her good, and then, instead of taking to the woods when I run off, I'd go down the river about fifty mile and camp in one place for good and not have such a rough time tramping on foot. It was pretty close to the shanty, and then I thought I heard the old man coming all the time, but I got her hid, and then I out and looked around a bunch of willows, and there was the old man down the path of peace, just drawing a bead on a bird with his gun, so we hadn't seen anything. When he got along, I was hard at it, taking up a trot line. He abused me a little while for being slow, but I told him I fell in the river, and that was what made me so long. I knowed he would see I was wet, and then he would be asking questions. We got five catfish off the lines and went home. While we laid off after breakfast to sleep up, both of us being about wore out, I got to thinking that if I could fix up some way to keep Pap and the widow from trying to follow me, it would be a certainer thing than trusting to luck to get far enough off before they missed me. You see, all kinds of things might happen. Well, I didn't see no way for a while, but by and by, Pap raised up a minute to drink another barrel of water, and he says, Another time a man comes a prowling round, here you roused me out, you hear? That man weren't here for no good. I'd have shot him. Next time you roused me out, you hear? But then he dropped down and went to sleep again. But what he had been saying giving, gave, gave me the very idea I wanted. I says to myself, I can fix it now so nobody won't think of following me. About twelve o'clock, we turned out and went along up the bank. The river was coming up pretty fast, and lots of driftwood going by on the rise. By and by, along comes part of a log raft, nine logs fast together. We went out with the skiff and towed it ashore. Then we had dinner. Anybody but Pab would have waited and seen the day through, so as to catch more stuff. But that weren't Pab's style. Nine logs was enough for one time. He might shove right over to town and sell. So he locked me in and took the skiff and started off towing the raft about half past three. I judged he wouldn't come back that night. I waited till I reckoned he had a good start. Then I out with my saw and went to work on that log again. Before he was on the other side of the river, I was out of the hole. Him and his raft was just a speck on the water away off yonder. I took the sack of cornmeal and took it to where the canoe was hid, and shoved the vines and branches apart and put it in. Then I done the same with the side of bacon, then the whiskey jug. 
I took all the coffee and sugar there was, and all the ammunition. I took the wadding, I took the bucket and gourd. I took a dipper and a tin cup, and my old saw and two blankets, and the skillet and the coffee pot. I took fish lines and matches and other things, everything that was worth a cent. I cleaned out the place. I wanted an axe, but there wasn't any, only the one out at the woodpile, and I knowed why I was going to leave there. I fetched out the gun, and now I was done. I had bore the ground a good deal crawling out of the hole and dragging out so many things. So I fixed that as good as I could from the outside by scattering dust on the place, which covered up the smoothness and the sawdust. Then I fixed the piece of log back into its place and put two rocks under it and one against it to hold it there, for it was bent up at that place and didn't quite touch the ground. If you stood four or five feet away and didn't know it was sawed, you wouldn't never notice it. And besides, this was back off the cabin, and it weren't likely anybody would go fooling around there. It was all glass clear to the canoe, so I hadn't left a track. I followed around to see. I stood on the bank and looked out over the river. All safe. So I took the gun and went up a piece into the woods, and was hunting around for some birds when I see a wild pig. Hogs soon went wild in them bottoms after they had got away from the prairie farms. I shot this fellow and took him into camp. I took the axe and smashed in the door. I beat it and hacked it considerable at doing it. I fetched the pig in and took him back nearly to the table and hacked into his throat with the axe and laid him down on the ground to bleed. I say ground because it was ground, hard packed and no boards. Well, next I took an old sack and put a lot of big rocks in it, all I could drag. And I started it from the pig and dragged it to the door and through the wood down to the river and dumped it in and down it sunk, out of sight. You could easy see that something had been dragged over the ground. I did wish Tom Sawyer was there. I know he would take an interest in this kind of business and throw in the fancy touches. Nobody could spread himself like Tom Sawyer in such a thing as that. Well, last I pulled out some of my hair and blooded the axe good, and it stuck it on the back side and slung the axe in the corner. Then I took up the pig and held him to my breast with my jacket, so he couldn't drip, till I got a good piece below the house and then dumped him into the river. Now I thought of something else, so I went and got the bag of meal and my old saw out of the canoe and fetched them to the house. I took the bag where it used to stand and ripped a hole in the bottom of it with the saw, for there weren't no knives and forks on the place. Pap done everything with his clasp knife about the cooking. Then I carried the sack about a hundred yards across the grass and through the willows east of the house to a shallow lake that was five mile wide and full of rushes, and ducks too, you might say, in the season. There was a slow, a slough, or a crack, a creek, excuse me, leading out of it, and on the other side, they went, that went miles away. I don't know where, but it didn't go to the river. The meal sifted out and made a little track all the way to the lake. I dropped Pap's whetstone there too, so as to look like it had been done by accident. Then I tied up the rip in the meal sack with a string so it wouldn't leak no more, and took it and my saw to the canoe again. It was about dark now, so I dropped the canoe down the river, under some willows that hung over the bank, and waited for the moon to rise. I made a fast to a willow, and then I took a bite to eat, and by and by laid down in the canoe to smoke a pipe and lay out a plan. I says to myself they'll follow the track of the sack full of rocks to the shore and then drag the river from me, and they'll follow that meal track to the lake and go browsing down the creek that leads out of it to find the robbers that killed me and took the things. They won't ever hunt the river for anything but my dead carcass. They'll soon get tired of it and won't bother no more about me. All right, 
I can stop anywhere I want to. Jackson's Island is good enough for me. I know that island pretty well and nobody ever comes there. And then I can paddle over to the town nights and slink around and pick up things I want. Jackson I Jackson's Island's the place. I was pretty tired and the first thing I knowed, I was asleep. When I woke up, I didn't know where I was for a minute. I sat up and looked around, a little scared. But then I remembered. The river looked miles and miles across. The moon was so bright, I counted the drift logs that went a slipping along, black and still, hundreds of yards out from shore. Everything was dead quiet, and it looked late and smelled late. You know what I mean. I don't know the words to put it in. I took a good gap and a stretch and was just going to unhitch and start when I heard a sound away over the water. I listened. Pretty soon I made it out. It was the dull kind of a regular sound that comes from oars working in rowlocks when it's a still night. I peeped out through the willow branches and there it was, a skiff away across the water. I couldn't tell how many was in it. It kept a coming and when it was abreast of me, I see there weren't but one man in it. Thinks I, maybe it's Pap, though I weren't expecting him. He dropped below me with the current, and by and by he came a swinging up ashore, up shore in the easy water, and he went by so close I could a reached out the gun and touched him. Well, it was Pap, sure enough, and sober too, by the way he laid his oars. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.